Welcome to the New Books Network. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Daniel Paris, host of New Books in Finance, a channel of the New Books Network. I'm delighted to have as my guest today Joshua Greenberg, author of the just issued Banknotes and Shin Plasters The Rage for Paper Money in the Early Republic. It's just published by the University of Pennsylvania Press. Joshua, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, Daniel, for having me. This, this was a fun book to read. It was an easy book to read, and it's just, it's just fascinating. Uh, I, I wonder, if, Joshua, if you could kind of take us backwards. We are currently sh- uh, living through a shift from what we might consider, broadly speaking, paper money, which we've all gotten used to through most of the 20th century, uh, prior to the 1970s, uh, uh, based backed by gold. Uh, after that, not so much. Uh, but we're on in the shift from uh, from paper money to to a sing- from a pa- singular paper money to a digital currency. Uh, and as participants in the economy, we have gotten used to the notion or getting used to the notion of digital currency in the same way we got used to the notion of a singular uh, paper currency. But it turns out throughout the 19th century and up into the 1920s uh, and 30s, there were there were many currencies. And uh, they weren't all of a national nature, uh, what we call greenbacks now informally, but were actually a formal structure. And then even prior to that, the period that you're covering from colonial period up through really the Civil War, there was an environment of currency that very few of us would feel comfortable with or even can imagine. Can you kind of take us backwards from where we are now to, to where the period that you're studying and how strikingly different it, it really is? Sure. Uh, you know, everyone now, I think, recognizes that uh, national currency is uniform in that there is one type of Federal Reserve note that everyone is using. That has been the case, uh, you know, in the United States really since the 1930s. Um, what has backed uh, that currency has changed, whether it was backed by gold or not uh, over time. But if you sort of go back to the 30s, Federal Reserve notes are the paper money that everyone uses. Uh, Between the 19-teens, when the Federal Reserve Act uh, was passed in the 1930s, there were multiple national currencies. Federal Reserve notes, in a sense, competed with or circulated side by side uh, with sort of other U.S. uh, federal notes. And also there were what were called national bank notes. The federal Greenbacks, the federal uh, notes, treasury notes, and the uh, the national bank notes actually have their beginning in the Civil War era. Uh, the sort of out of the chaos of the Civil War era were created these two sort of types of national currencies. One uh, issued as part of a network of national banks around the country, where the notes all sort of looked the same, but were branded locally with whatever national bank had issued them. And remember, let's for our listeners, a, a national bank would be chartered nationally, but it could be a, a bank in your neighborhood, in your city. It just had a national charter, but it didn't come from a singular bank. It was a many, many such banks, hundreds upon hundreds of them, but issuing similar but not identical notes. Correct? Right. The uh, Right. The, the vignettes, the sort of the, the language on the note would all be similar, uh, but it would be locally branded. The, the first bank of National Bank of Chicago would say it was from the first National Bank of Chicago. But the imagery and all the sort of uh, other aspects of the note would look the same as the first National Bank of Detroit or the first National Bank of uh, Poughkeepsie. Uh, they would all look the same, but with local branding. Uh, just telling which which branch, in a sense, uh, these were all these were all coming out of because they had uh, individual charters. Uh, this was separate from the uh, national uh, notes that were you know usually referred to as greenbacks uh, that were issued by the federal government. Uh, these were the legal tender notes that came out of the Civil War era, and again, uh, these were sort of limited in in how many of them could circulate. They weren't really issued in terms of uh, new ones after the Civil War era, uh, except to replace ones that that came in during the Civil War. But these also circulated alongside national banknotes. So between the Civil War and the early 20th century, you have sort of two national types of notes 
that circulate nationally. They are redeemable nationally, uh, which means that their face value is protected as they circulate nationally. Uh, and that is a sort of a, a uniform system. So let's uh, st- stop there just again for yeah. summarization. So we have Federal Reserve notes uh, coming in from in the teens and taking over by the 30s. And uh, we refer to them informally as greenbacks, but technically that's not uh, so the greenbacks were f- from a prior system. So from the teens on, we have one-ish system. Uh, but prior to that, there are two systems of national notes. So we've gone from one system to two systems. We have the national banks, nationally chartered banks, plus the U.S. government issued notes, which are called greenbacks because they happen to be green. The Federal Reserve does pick up on the green theme. It continues with the green, but they're not really the original greenbacks. So we've gone from one system of notes in the 20th century to – two system of notes in from the Civil War up to the early 20th century. And uh, fair summary to point? Yes. I mean, everything's always more complicated, but yes, that, that's, that, that's, the, that's the best way of thing to think about it. You have two, two types of notes coming out of the Civil War era, and these sort of gets consolidated during the 20th century so that really since the Great Depression, there's one type of uniform note, and that's what everyone sort of recognizes today. So, and, and again, the notion that a dollar is worth a dollar, regardless of which store you use it in, and now, and that a dollar has the same value in Pennsylvania that it has in California, is a common notion, and that money as a medium of exchange would have some sort of stability to it is something we've gotten all used to, so much so that we actually don't need the money anymore. We don't need the paper the cotton, we are comfortable increasingly with just digital systems. But that notion that a dollar is a dollar is a dollar is a relatively new. It's post the Civil War because, and here's where we lead into your book, if we had one or even two systems of currency, which were standardized, reasonably standardized from the Civil War on, please tell us about the period prior to the Civil War, uh, banknotes and shin plasters, the rage for paper money in the early republic, it is a completely different environment. So now we're, 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 the stage has been set. Please proceed. Okay. So before the Civil War, uh, the, the way the system works is that the federal government has very little role in issuing paper money. Uh, what this means is that the paper money that most people are using are issued by individual banks that have a sort of state regulation uh, or sort of a, a, a lack of federal regulation is almost a better way to think about it. And that, that what this means is that every individual bank issues its own money. Uh, by the time you get to the pre-Civil War era, this could be upwards of 1,400 banks in the United States, all issuing their own notes that look different, that have different imagery, that have different language on it, that have different rules because every state had their own banking and currency regulations. Uh, And so it's amazingly chaotic because rather than one or two systems of uniform currency backed by the power of the federal government in some capacity, you have literally thousands of types of paper money all circulating simultaneously with a variety of dozens of different state regulations, um, you know, trying trying to uh, sort of keep these in check. In addition to all of these banknotes, there's a whole world of uh, unregulated or semi-regulated shin plasters, which can be issued by merchants, by local municipal governments, uh, or corporations. Uh, and this just multiplies, uh, you know, the, the numbers of paper money uh, really into an astronomical place. So what one area of commonality as far as I can tell, and I may have missed this in the book, is that uh, utter chaos before the Civil War, fascinating, we'll get to the fascinating part, but the uh, there did appear to be some agreement that a dollar and five dollars and ten dollars, and it was a notion of a dollar, not perhaps shillings or other measures of currency that might have existed. But even early on, it is a dollar, not the US dollar, but it is a dollar and five dollars and ten dollars. Is that is that correct, or did I did that also was that also a disputed and had to be worked out? Uh, no, I, I think that that's right. In that they're following the the federal government, which is coining money and setting, uh, you know, has, actually has rules for 
you know, the, the, the dollar being the standard currency uh, in, that, in that way, so that you see the dollar is the standard, uh, you know, sort of unit. Uh, but something like the denominations of the money are, you know, are set individually. And so, you know, what this means is that what type of dollar and how many cents literally could be uh, on on the paper money, you know, varied uh, based on each individual bank. And and the reason everyone's issuing money, and this is where we get into macroeconomics, and it's very important because it, it continues to be an issue through the late 19th century, less so in the 20th, is that there's simply no other medium of exchange available to keep up with the level of commerce in the 19th century. And specie, that is gold or silver, there just wasn't enough of it. And so you have people wishing to engage in transactions, but there's no medium of exchange for those transactions because there's just not enough gold. There's just not enough silver in circulation. It becomes a political issue of one chapter on that. Uh, And uh, in the absence of sufficient gold and silver, this is something that has plagued civilizations for 5,000 years since uh, they became uh, complex enough to to, ha- to have a need for mediums of exchange, there's just not enough of the mon- of the uh, metal that passes in society. Global society is the basic medium of exchange: gold and/or silver. And so people start writing notes and say, "I owe you five bucks," and you know, it becomes a little more formal. And and here it is. And then you have thousands and thousands of entities doing it. But it, it's responding to a need, the growth of a uh, of economic activity that requires a medium of exchange when there's just not enough of that medium around. And, and that uh, when there's a will, there's a way. And so paper shows up. It creates all sorts of controversies. Uh, it also creates fascinating cultural moments about how people treat paper money. Your book is filled with interesting stories uh, uh, about that. Uh, do you want to you know, head down that path of you know, your, your favorite moments of people negotiating the value, the usage, the physicality of the money? Listen, if you have two, a $10 bill and you need uh, two $5 bills, what do you do? Well, you, you cut it in half. Of course, that's what you do. Why else? What wouldn't you do? It's a perfectly sensible thing. Uh, and and, and uh, other stories like that, please. Uh, sure. And, and, you know, and this is really key. I think when I set out to, to write the book, I was trying to tell not necessarily an institutional history of banking, but really what this crazy system was like for the Americans that were trying to navigate it. You know, all, all of the, the chaos in the system that, that you could see here really translated to chaos on sort of a daily basis. And so you know, what this means, as you said, is that if you're trying to just make a simple purchase, you know, you, you have a note and you want to make a simple purchase, it's not as simple as handing over a bill and buying the thing that you want. Part of this could be as you said, a massive shortage of the actual amount of cash in the economy. Uh, And the other part of this that is, I think, really key for understanding the chaos of these currency negotiations is that because every bank is issuing their own money and the money is circulating around the economy, it loses value the further it circulates from the institution that issues it. And this is really key. Um, if you issue a, if you're a bank in Michigan and you issue a five dollar note, the further that note moves from Michigan, the less it's going to be worth because technically it's only worth five dollars in the equivalent of gold and silver if you bring it back to the bank that issued it. That's the sort of the the regulation you know for for banking in in the in the state of Michigan, which means that if your five dollar note all of a sudden winds up in New York City no one's going to give you $5 worth of merchandise for that because it, you know, it's, it's got to be uh, sort of taken all the way back to Michigan for the equivalent of $5. So every time you go to use your $5 Michigan note, you have to have a conversation, a negotiation with the person you're trying to hand it to over what is the actual value of that note. Uh, you know, for example, uh, you know, I'll give an example of, of a bank. There's a bank in the town of Monroe, Michigan, called the Bank of River Raisin. Sort of a you know a, a, a not great bank with a bad reputation, uh, and it circulates lots of money. If you have a five dollar bill from the Bank of River Raisin that was issued in the late 1830s, and you're in New York City and you're trying to buy something something with that, 
it will only buy you about $4.25 worth of, you know, dried goods or, or food or, or, you know, or, or materials in, in New York City. Uh, you're, I'm you're sorry, how much the, a $10 bill would got, get you $4.25? Uh, well, in this case, it's a $5 bill. bill. I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, $5 seven. bill, yes. That's okay. But what that means that every time you try to spend a $5 bill from this bank, you're having to negotiate with someone, well, you know, will you give me $4.25? Will you give me $4.30? What can I do in this transaction to try and maybe get a slightly better, uh, you know, negotiating uh, negotiating point than, you know, than yesterday? And this is a constantly changing, uh, a, a constantly changing thing. So newspapers would run uh, tables, what they called banknote tables, that would uh, provide you know the latest daily uh, sort of trading value for banknotes from around the country in whatever city you happen to be. And so you can think about all the work that would have to go into trying to figure out, well, I, I know I have a $5 bill that I got a couple of days ago for $4.25 worth of, of food at, at, a, you know, at a store. If I go to spend that, can, will I be able to get a little bit better or a little bit worse? And you know, should I hold on to it until maybe the, the trading uh, you know, value improves or should I try and spend it as quick as possible? Uh, this is what you have to do you know, every day when you're sitting there and looking at, at the notes in, in your wallet. And so there, there's a, a, you know, a concept in modern finance, which is central called discounting, which everything in the future gets discounted back to, discounted back to the present. In this case, this is a form of discounting from the distance, because as you say, the further you get, there's a discount. And, and a huge difference is the discount rate. Is it, you know, is it a little bit or uh, a lot? And the further you get, the higher it is. It also creates the notion, which I think people don't really appreciate, the notion of money markets. We think of a money market, most people think of a money market or money market fund as a, a way of getting a little bit of interest by uh, owning short-term securities. But underneath that historically were money markets where people bring together money and discount the notes and people take risk by accepting a note in New York of a Monroe, Michigan bank and vice versa and uh, coming up with uh, with uh, rates of discount and so forth to justify taking uh, that risk, and so there were there were markets for money. And periodically during the Great Financial Crisis, the market for money reappeared as something uh, associated with risk. This is so. Yes, it's the uh, you know nearly two hundred years ago, but uh, it's important to understand that the, even you know the value of money is negotiable, perhaps even in, in the current day, and and periodically is. Uh, and so uh, I think that's something that, that readers need to, and citizens, people and the participants in the economy need to understand. I, that, that's really important. Yeah. Money markets were, you know, were physical places, just like the, the money that they were trading were physical entities. And you know, every town and you know, in, in big cities would have multiple ones, but every town you know, has usually a broker or two, a uh, money broker. And they collect notes from all different banks, you know, from all different places, and they will, you know, buy and sell them. And if you are needing money, you can go to one of these money markets in order to, you know, in a sense, buy money uh, at, a, at a discount, as you were talking about. And, and the way this works and, you know, how this ripples through the economy is that, say, you're in, in a place like Philadelphia and you are uh, a, a foreman or a master craftsman and you... You have, uh, you know, five or ten uh, journeyman artisans working for you. Well, you pay your artisans once a week. You know, Saturday night is payday. Uh, so on Saturday morning, you head down to the money market. You uh, buy your payroll for the week. Say your payroll for the week is a thousand dollars. You say, well, you know, how much is it going to cost me to get a thousand dollars worth of notes? The thousand dollars that you need is a face value thousand dollars. But you'll only have to pay, say, nine hundred and you know fifty dollars or nine hundred and sixty dollars in the money market to get what amounts to a thousand dollars of face value notes. You then pay your workers with that thousand dollars. And the problem here is that if you're one of the workers being paid on Saturday night, every time you get paid with money from a bad bank, from an out of state bank, you're actually losing a percentage of the money that you just work for that week. Your, your boss has made 
you know, 10 or $15 uh, on your labor for that week, just in the way that they're paying you. Uh, so you have, you know, tr trade unions and, you know, working men, uh, sort of political parties, uh, you know, arguing about this, uh, you know, in these years saying, well, you know, one of the problems we have with, with banking and the currency system is that literally every time we get paid, uh, we're being, you know, sort of uh, screwed out of some of our own money. There's a discount even if it's not, uh, even if you didn't try to pass a Monroe note in Chicago, there, there's a discount. When banks, local banks, and there were plenty of local banks, they would come and go and issue their notes and immediately be discounted and uh, you have lots of stories about them. But even sometimes banks were insufficient to issue, to meet the man, man, demand for currency as a, as a medium of exchange. So in many of the smaller towns and villages across this country in the first half of the 19th century, merchants themselves would issue what we might call money, letters of credit, IOUs, whatever the case may be. The, you want to, can you explain the origin of the term shin plaster and how non-bank institutions necessarily found themselves basically doing just the same thing? They may not have printed quite as pretty a money, but uh, it was essentially the same thing, probably with a lower uh, travel radius, uh, but, but still basically the same concept. Right. Uh, there's there's certainly moments uh, during financial panics, uh, during downturns in the economy in particular, uh, or just location, if there's not enough sort of there, there's no bank around, uh, where uh, currency shortages in given areas mean that there's, you know, again, not just the normal thirst uh, for paper currency, but one that spills over into uh, local merchants or even a local uh, municipal government deciding that they need to issue paper money to replace the shortfall in the economy. And sometimes, uh, you know, the denominations they're issuing in are, you know, very, very low down to, you know, six and a half cents, what would be considered sort of a half of a shilling because um, there's no small change around. And so what you have is, again, merchants or municipal governments uh, issuing these shin plasters. The term shin plaster uh, there's a couple of different uh, sort of ideas about, of where, about where it comes from. But basically, these notes were thought to be of such poor quality, especially physically poor quality, um, because they were made cheaply, that they reminded people of the plaster bandages that people used to put on their shins during the Revolutionary War. Uh, so these, these shin plasters uh, from the Revolutionary War um, uh, sort of became, became the term that, that people used for these poor quality paper notes, uh, you know, that could be issued. And, you know, again, it's, it's an interesting thing. You think of them as very bad versions of a banknote, but as you said, they usually circulate locally, you know, a, a banknote issued by a, a glass blowing factory uh, in New Jersey is not going to necessarily circulate very far from that glass blowing factory because no one's going to be you know, willing to accept it. But if that factory is considered a good business and a reputable business with a long history in that small New Jersey town, locally, people could give a lot of confidence to a note issued by that organization. And so you, you run into an interesting situation where, you know, especially during the financial panic, if someone offered you a, a locally circulating shin plaster from a reputable com company that you knew and trusted, would that be worse or better than taking a legal banknote from a bank you had a lot of questions about that was three states away and that wouldn't circulate at face value? Uh, these are the kinds of decisions you might have to make. Uh, in, in a lot of cases, a, a local municipal government or, or a local reputable merchant might actually be issuing better currency than a legal bank from three states away. And, and again, it's worth reminding current readers and participants in the financial system that a bank could fail in this period. There was, uh, again, currency all was associated with the bank and banks failed all the time and there was no FDIC and there was no SEC and there was no recourse. And if a bank failed, it failed and uh, notes issued by said bank became uh, discounted completely to zero and it happened all the time so that individuals, and this is, I think, really the interesting part of your book and you highlight over and over again, is that individuals participating in the financial system had to engage in sort of 
calculations in their head about the worthiness of their counterparties for currency. We, we don't do that when we see a dollar bill or a $10 bill. Uh, curiously, we did it a little bit in the early stages of the internet, and we still have to face some risk when we transfer money or pay for something online, but it's mostly viewed as, as trustworthy. That was not the case. We had to assess, uh, the pe- participants in the system in the early 19th century had to assess, do their own discount rates. Who did they know? Who was the friend of the, whose uncle who set this up? Who lived in that town? Uh, and, and make you have a story about uh, a merchant accepting banks from a uh, issued in Maine, I think in New York or Philadelphia, it doesn't matter because they said they would uh, take those notes at full value because they happened to have relatives in that town. They would package up those notes, send them back to the hometown and know that they would be redeemed in full when normally a, a note from Maine would be heavily discounted you know, uh, if, it, if it was in the mid-Atlantic area. So all of these very complex calculations that we we just don't do anymore, but they were they're fascinating kind of mental gymnastics that that anyone in the financial system had to deal with uh, in the early nineteenth century. Yeah, this is vital, and I think it's really as you said, sort of the centerpiece of the book, which is that no matter who you were, if you were a banker, if you were an artisan, if you were uh, you know an enslaved woman in in the in the South, if you were. A uh, you know a housewife on a in you know in, in a Philadelphia you know ta- in Philadelphia home, you have to accumulate as much financial know-how and monetary information as you can, so that you can make your best judgment about which notes you should take, what type of value you should put on those notes, and and how to act in the market. And everyone has to do this, even though they're not necessarily all privy to the same information, they have to all sort of scramble to accumulate as much as possible. Uh, the the uh, hat maker that you mentioned is a guy named Leonard Bond. He's a hat maker in New York City. And in one of his many advertisements, he advertises a lot in newspapers for his hats. He says, uh, I'd be willing to take at face value uh, notes from the Vassalboro Bank in Maine. And this raises red flags because in, in mid, the mid-1820s, the Vassalboro Bank in Maine is a notoriously bad bank, which is dumping lots and lots of notes in the New York market, and no one wants to use these notes uh, because they, are, they don't hold their value, and if you have to use them, there, there usually is a big discount. The fact that he says in his advertisement, please come to my hat shop and I'll take these notes at face value uh, is a great way to try and drum up business, or at least he believes it's a great way to drum up business because anyone would stuck with one of these notes can come buy a hat from him. The reason this works for him is that, you know, his family is back in Maine and they live very close to where the Vassalboro bank is located. Uh, He even owns property up there. So he can take all these bad notes you know, send them back to his family and then they can cash them in, you know, at face value in Maine. And so the family hasn't lost any money and he's made a bunch of hat sales. Um, These types of relationships, whether they're for individuals like our, you know, hat maker Leonard Bond, or they're between banks where banks from different states actually form alliances in order to try and dump their notes in different markets and, you know, redeem them at different, uh, you know, price points. Uh, this is, you know, happening as well. So all of these things are happening at the same time where individuals are scrambling for as much information as possible uh, while other people are, you know, colluding and using arbitrage in order to try and maximize, uh, you know, their exposure in this money market. So there, there are lots of stories about rational or irrational economic behavior which would thrill the hearts of the University of Chicago. But I think equally <laughs> equally interesting are the stories that people develop a personal relationship with the money. Uh, they write on it. There are so many different types of money aesthetically that you can choose one over the other. Money is uh, kind of identified, oh, that's a good bill. Uh, that's a, and it's not just the, the, uh, the discount rate associated with it. It's, it's the evidence of personal relationships, meaning personal value associated with it. People got intertwined with their money or associated with it in ways that you wouldn't expect with one $10 bill or any other $10 bill, and certainly not with digital currency because it all is essentially the same. But uh, the bills look different, uh, the great variety, those aesthetically appealing, those less aesthetically appealing, printing quality varied, and people would write on the notes. 
and it could, uh, they were, you know, I'm about to get married. What was the line? I'm, I'm, I'm Lord help me something or other. I'm about to get married. Someone writes on the, on their bill, uh, among other things. So it, it, it's so different from what we're used to now, this, this personal element, uh, to, to the a medium of exchange. Yeah. And, and, and it happens sort of from both sides of the relationship. And what I mean by this is that, uh, bankers, are constructing notes, you know, putting on the vignettes and arranging imagery and arranging text on a note in order to try and get the note to do certain things. If they want the note to look really good and maybe circulate for a long time, the longer the note circulates, the, the more money they're technically making because it's issued as a loan. Uh, and if, if as long as it do, never comes back to the bank, you know, to be redeemed for specie, they're actually making money on the interest of the loan. But so if you want a really beautiful note that'll circulate for a long time, you, you know, get, get really fancy uh, images and you arrange them in a way. Um, so you might do it that way. The, the other option is to try and make a note that sort of maybe hides in the background. It looks like a lot of other notes. The, 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 the vignettes are a little more generic. And so maybe you'll, people will think it's from even a different bank or maybe a better bank if your bank is not so great. Uh, so there's these choices being made by the people producing the bank notes. Um, but then they send them out into, you know, into circulation. And once they get into the hands of, uh, you know, American consumers, um, they are their physical entities that those American consumers have to use to mediate their market experience. A lot of banknotes and shin plasters are only printed on one side, especially, uh, you know, in the years before the sort of, you know, the late antebellum period, usually banknotes are only printed on one side. That blank, that blank back of the note becomes, you know, a billboard, as you were mentioning, for people to put, to write all sorts of things, all sorts of sort of graffiti or, or ideas about the quality of the note, about you know personal things that are happening to them. You can see notes where someone on the back of it has written, "This is a damn fine bill," you know, maybe trying to either you know impress upon someone else that they should accept the bill. Uh, there are other ones that are, you know beautiful poetry about how heartbroken they are that they used to have a hundred dollars, but then they started gambling and the $5 that they're writing on is their last $5, almost like a last will and testament and writing it on the back of a banknote uh, again, sort of personalizes that experience uh, in, in other ways. Uh, some people put jokes, often it's political slogans. Uh, you know, if you're someone who doesn't like banks and if you don't, you know, you're, you're upset about the way that paper money is treating you, uh, you know, maybe a political slogan on the back of it or a quote from, you know, Daniel Webster or something like that is the way that you engage with the market. And as these notes circulate, you know, the next person who grabs it, they can, you know, flip it onto the back and, and see what messages are on there from the last person who had it. Uh, one funny one that I can think of is where someone is writing on the back of a note, you know, lamenting that they've lost all this money gambling, and someone else has written on the back of the same note, um, well, you know, I won this note uh, betting on a horse race in this town in Maine. Uh, if you get it back, maybe you should try your luck again. Uh, th these are all sort of funny ways uh, in which people are, you know, using paper money not as a way of sort of separating themselves from the market, you know, sort of, a, you know, if you think about money as being maybe sort of making these types of relationships, you know, less sincere and, and you know, and um, less formal, uh, and more, sorry, more formal, uh, the, the way that they're using, uh, you know, the, the writing on the back of the note actually personalizes the note and makes it more intimate. So you, you mentioned that someone wrote political slogans, and it's not a big part of your book, but it's it's worth mentioning that uh, there was at this time periodically a Bank of the United States, which also is chartered by the uh, – in the first half of the 19th century, chartered by the Congress that issued notes as well. But it, it didn't dominate the economic landscape, uh, and the existence of a, a Bank of the U.S., uh, and the rechartering of the Bank of the U.S. becomes a highly political issue uh, in the first half of the 19th century. And then we basically, during the Civil War, we have these nationally chartered banks, but not a Bank of the U.S., not a Federal Reserve System. That only comes into play in the early 20th century. But this, the politics of uh, the Bank of the U.S. and issuing currency and paper money versus gold becomes is a highly political issue. Again, it's not really the focus of your, your book, 
particularly both before the Civil War, but also in the late 19th century, it, it attracts the attention of the national parties. It is a major, a major political issue. This is on the cultural side. I think financial histories cover, traditional financial histories cover those politics of the Bank of the U.S., the First Bank of the U.S. and the Second Bank of the U.S., and uh, the Civil War plans and, and the final emergence of Federal Reserve notes. But the cultural side is, is really what uh, is something that you're focused on and I think is just a, a, a gem uh, of your, your coverage. So I, I, uh, I thank you for it. The, the book is Banknotes and Shin Plasters, The Rage for purple, uh, Paper Money, not Purple Money, <laughs> The Rage for Paper Money in the Early Republic by Joshua Greenberg. Joshua, by the way, is currently editor of Commonplace, a journal of early American life. And you can see his work and, and the, the journal at commonplace.online. Uh, Joshua, thank you so much for, for being a guest on the show. Thank you so much for having me, Daniel. I enjoyed it.